Hey, welcome to Christ Over Coffee uh, for this uh, week. This is uh, Wednesday, uh, June 17th, and uh, just wanted to touch base here as we continue on uh, moving forward uh, ahead with uh, each and every week. And I thought I would share that video uh, there as a beginning. Uh, with, uh, it was made by a contributor at Creation Swap, and I thought it was uh, quite impactful in what it presented there. Uh, because today, you know, one of the big issues uh, in our society, it went from uh, COVID-19 and quickly uh, from May 25th, uh, it was quickly changed to where we still are uh, worried about the coronavirus and what it might do, but we're also dealing with the impacts of what has been perpetrated, uh, unfortunately, um, and it's caused a great divide within our country. Uh, now that divide has been there for a while, um, but uh, it, it will continue uh, until we really address it head on, especially for those of us in the church. Um, you know, one of the one of the great things uh, that uh, uh, well, actually, let me share a quote that I I've been in a book uh, by. Trevor Sutton, um, he wrote a pastor uh, in the Missouri Synod, the Lutheran Church, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, uh, put this together um, called Being Lutheran. Um, and uh, there are some things he, he read in here I'm going to share with you um, that really struck me, and I wanted to kind of talk about uh, some of his stuff. Uh, he wrote in, in his... Uh, in his book, uh, actually being Lutheran in the sixth chapter, page 129, he, uh, he's talking about how Christ is, is the answer. And actually prior to that, uh, he speaks of Pelican's, uh, last words, uh, which, uh, Yaroslav Pelican was a great Lutheran, American Lutheran theologian, uh, and, has contributed so much uh, to uh, those of us of the Lutheran Christian faith on understanding what it is that we believe and uh, putting it often in a, in a way he translated many of Luther's writings uh, and uh, made sure that, uh, that we could hear the voice of our faith, which is one that truly is, uh, yeah, we have our areas of where work was needed, uh, yes, everybody that uh, studies uh, Luther or knows them a little bit about Luther, often uh, you can find that uh, he uh, had a coarse tongue at times, and uh, there was uh, one particular track that he wrote that was uh, uh, that we as Lutherans uh, do not uphold, uh, often because, yes, it was uh, at a time of uh, strong anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, uh, as we enter into this debate on racism uh, and the issues that have been going on, it's at the same time that there has been an increased, uh, raising, uh, increased amount of anti-Semitism in our land, which is also uh, a problematic thing that we should really... Uh, you know, prejudice is prejudice, uh, and there's no excuse just because they're not uh, of a certain group. Um, we shouldn't be anti any group, and unfortunately, we keep finding uh, that if there's a way, something we can divide ourselves on, uh, we will do whatever we can to try and justify ourselves. Instead, uh, you know, the goal of our faith is one that is meant to bring unity. And Christ ultimately came uh, to bring unity in our faith under God. Um, under the Bible, it means um, there are those that belong to God and those that do not. And that's the one differentiation the difference uh, for Christians is we shouldn't be looking at the ones who do not know God and wagging our finger at them in the sense of hating them. Um, but ultimately, we should be praying for them. Uh, we should be desiring that they be grafted into the faith, that they be grafted in 
to God's chosen people and uh, be under the umbrella of, of our Lord and our Savior. And uh, that is, uh, I think sometimes we forget that. Uh, we forget uh, because we get caught in our own webs of what we think is right, wrong, or otherwise. But um, the final words that he quotes on page 127 in Being Lutheran uh, is uh, Yaroslav Pelikan is quoted as saying his last words, If Christ is risen, then nothing else matters. And if Christ is not risen, then nothing else matters. Uh, these words are ones that really um, should resonate with most of us. It, it, it all is about Christ. If, if, he, if, if Christ is risen, we have the hope and the promise of salvation. Um, if Christ is not risen, then we're on our own, and we have to find a way to make ourselves right or better. And uh, it doesn't come through virtue signaling. It doesn't come through uh, alone in our actions. We know that because um, one person's virtue can be another person's vice. Somebody else can believe something is very good, and it can be a very destructive thing in, in the end. Um, and without God, without the center of faith, it's really it's hard for us to realize because outside of Christ, I mean, if you truly look at the world, there is only one thing that is a constant in our world, that, uh, you know, happiness is fleeting, wealth is fleeting, um, everything, life ends, everything ends, everything has its limitations. So when we think about what it is that we believe and what we hold to, uh, and if we center that in Christ, you know, re reality would be is if Christ is not risen, but I live as though, though he was, if that's not true, you know, then I'm a sad person in the sense that in the end, I'm going to find out it was all for naught. But it will not change how I live my life, or it should not change how I live my life to be a positive influence in the world. And as Christians, we are called to be positive influences in our world. But I like this quote as he speaks about racism. Bigotry has no permanent remedy in education, activism, or public service announcements. Any progress made by these efforts is quickly erased by one protest, one bullet, or one bomb. Slavery is not an entry in a history book. Entire tribes and nationalities continue to work against their will for others. Terrorism utilizes everyday technology, planes, computers, and social media to create a worldwide web of violence. All a person needs is a few hundred dollars and some household items to inflict unimaginable brutality. Why toil to make social progress if the next generation is going to undo it all anyway? If we don't center ourselves in a positive faith in Jesus Christ, and what I mean by that is really focusing on what does the Bible say? What is God doing? There was a differentiation of people groups at the time of Jesus. There always has been differentiations of people groups. But Jesus, he was a little different in some in the ways because we know that in the end, the goal is not to have a segmented group. But at the time, at the time of Jesus and at the time prior, see God in the early, in the Old Testament, he chose the people of Israel. He specifically chose them out of the descendants of Abraham uh, and set them apart to be his people. The whole goal of that was to have the people follow him and follow his ways and his law. We find throughout the Old Testament that there are areas in which they continually fail. I mean, you can find within Joshua, uh, and many people look at Joshua and they see the violence or read the violence that goes on in there and they say, oh, that can't be God, God's will. Well, 
God's will is different than ours. God's ways are different than ours. Uh, really, you read through Joshua, the obedience, and the history of it is we see that when Joshua and the people failed to follow God's decree and saying, I don't want the stain of false idols in the promised land. I don't want that. Those that are following false gods, false idols, they're dead anyway. They're already gone. They don't belong to me. Uh, and I don't want them influencing you. And the sad reality is that more often than not, we are influenced by those that believe differently than us. You know, as Christians, uh, groups, I mean, some would say we've ghettoized ourselves. And there's some truth to that. You know, I mean, uh, we can segment ourselves in society where all we listen to is Christian music. All we read are Christian books. Our only places we go are Christian places, in either our church or we go to a Christian coffee shop or we go to specialty Christian stores or we go and we can truly segment ourselves even to the point where our, the only gym we ever go to is a Christian gym. It might be the gym that's a, that maybe a mega church uh, opens up and has a gym within theirs that you can purchase a membership to be a part of that gym or, uh, and, and be, if you're a part of that church, you, you have special access. Yes, those things, that's, that, that 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 happens and it it's it's our nature to segment ourselves away uh, and the reality in the idea of when we think of separations is there are those that belong to God and those that don't it has nothing to do it shouldn't have anything to do with our our nationality our skin color our uh, background all of that it's you have those that belong to God and those that don't. And they're of all different shades on both sides. The difference, I mean, as Christians, though we are called to minister to those that do not know God and pray for them. And if you are praying for someone, it's very difficult to hate someone that you're praying for. It's very difficult to be against someone that you have wept over and that you have prayed over and over and over. And that's what God desires for us to do. But we see the separation of what God was doing, even Jesus was doing in the beginning. And much of it, if you look at it throughout the beginning of Jesus' ministry to the the parts where there were those that were not a part of the group that Jesus welcomes in. And it happens a lot. I'm gonna let's I'm gonna go bring you to Lagos, my Lagos software here. And we're gonna look at the tenth chapter of Matthew. And we're going to start at the, uh, this was the, uh, the naming of those. And I know, you know, many will find this familiar from Sunday, but, you know, we think of the names here. We have the names of the apostles. We have Simon, who is called Peter and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Um, each of these were set apart, chosen by Jesus. He even includes the one who would betray him. Uh, and Jesus, you know, you have to realize that Jesus knew that all of that. Jesus knew that Judas Iscariot would betray him. He is God. Jesus knew that, uh, that Peter... Simon Peter would deny him three times. Knowing all this, I cannot imagine the grief and the sorrow that would have been in the heart of, of Jesus throughout this. But he sends them out on a mission, and he gives them, he empowers them with different powers in the sense of, uh, you know, this was not something that the average 
follower of God would do or have. Uh, the power to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons, and uh, don't and don't don't accept don't don't ask for payment. Don't require or ask for payment. Uh, don't acquire gold or silver or copper for your belts. Don't do this for your benefit. Do it for their benefit. And that's the reality of us in our faith is we're called. But he also says, go nowhere among the Gentiles, enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, at the time we see a separation. When we look at that, it is a definite separation. Do not go anywhere where the Gentiles are. Don't go to the towns of the Samaritans, but go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then proclaim to them. Now, these are the people that God had chosen. These are the people that had had heard the word of God, knew the word of God, should have known exactly what it was that God was going to do, should be prepared or waiting for the coming of this one that God had chosen to be, and the people of God's choice to be able to, they should have been hungry for these words. At least that's what one would think if you were raised up in a certain faith and understanding and you were made to know but the th- truth is, is there there was a lot of differentiation and thoughts were different. Everybody had their own understanding. You know, I may believe differently than you and da, da, da. It's not very dissimilar from our world today. And there are some that they just kind of, whatever was uh, around, they, they just kind of said, well, you know, you believe what you believe, I believe what I believe, and we're going to be good together. Uh, you know, just don't tell me what I need to believe. Well, we find some difficulty when we when we run into these things. But see, Jesus was sending them out to proclaim truth. Now, the healings, all the miracles, those were secondary. Those were weapon those weren't weapons of like destruction. He wasn't going out. He was going out with miracles to be able to say, if you see this miracle, you'll recognize that God is coming. And the whole point of that was that he wanted the people of God to turn to God. Now, I'm not going to get into the discussion of whether or not we as followers of Christ receive these gifts also through our baptism. Uh, I know there's debate amongst different Christian bodies about this, even amongst Lutherans. Uh, There are some varied views on are these gifts that were given at a time and no longer are utilized or given now? Uh, I'm I'm not going to go into that direction at this time because uh, we can. I know that God heals, and I know that God can do all things. Um, and the question is whether does He give us these gifts? Uh, well, uh, I if I disagree with those that uh, say they have these gifts, um, but they do so saying, "Here, give me some money, pay me, help support me." Um, we don't require those. Now, you know, as a pastor, uh, if I'm doing the work that I'm called to do, uh, you know, we, we are, you know, there is a pay that comes with that, but it's not something of saying, uh, you know, demanding it out of people, uh, or guilting people to do so. Uh, it's, uh, you know, but the same side of this is, is that they were going in, see their pay would have been, uh, shelter over their head, food in their bellies, and uh, their their needs supplied to them. Not uh, if they had it, then they they kept it. But if they they didn't demand anything of people or ha- go with an expectation. The other side, though, is if there was people that didn't take the peace and went, you know, being a peace I give to you, peace I my peace I leave to you. If you came into a town and they were they thought you were somebody that. They didn't want in their town or was going to bring trouble. They didn't want to hear the message. Then, then by all means, leave. And don't even take the dust with you. Um, just leave their dust behind. Kick it off the bottoms of your sandals. You want nothing from them. And it'll let God be the one who takes that. Uh, let God be the one who becomes angry. So when we think about, um, when we think about this, Imagine Judas uh, being included, and one of the things that uh, many may have a hard time with, but, uh, you know, God can use anybody 
that he desires to use, even the imperfect. And he will use the imperfect. He does use the imperfect. We all are imperfect. Uh, even even though Judas's heart was, uh, Iscariot's heart was to some extent hardened against God, God still used him. And he was be able, he was brought into this. Uh, he, we don't read about any specific miracles or anything that he did himself. Uh, but we don't really read anything about any of them. Uh, well, for the, in this point of doing any very specific miracles in and of themselves there, but they were sent out to proclaim the message. And we can assume that Judas at this point also was sending out the message. Uh, I'm sure there was a part in Judas's spirit that was, was being moved by what Jesus was doing. That's why he followed him for these three years and he sat with him. Uh, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking that he, would turn his back on Jesus that he ended up um, he ended up betraying him and ended up losing his life by, because of that he took his own life because of the guilt that came upon him because uh, he realized what he had done um, but you know the whole goal of this and I Martin Luther explains kind of as he opens up on this chapter as his explanation of this uh, and I'm going to go back and transition over. I'm going to put it back to my Lagos there, put you on that screen. Um, but he says this chapter is full of application and thoroughly necessary because the whole church was about to undergo ch change, namely from the synagogue into the, to the, into the church of the Gentiles. It was therefore very needful that those whose task it was to effect that change should receive a clear and manifest calling for the removal of the law and of the kingdom of the law was a change not unlike the flood by which the old world was turned into a new world. And indeed, the gospel did make a new world out of the law, out of the law. And so it was fitting for those leaders of the new kingdom to be called by none other than the Lord himself. Second, he granted them the authority and power to perform miracles, and this too was necessary because of the great innovation and change in the state of affairs, and yet he does not give them weaponry, but miracles, so that they might recognize that, the, that his kingdom was spiritual and not corporeal, and so he gives them spiritual weapons against spiritual wickedness, that is, against the devil, sin, death, disease, and against everything that belongs to the devil." Third, he teaches them what kind of men they ought to be with respect to their own persons. And this entire chapter has to do with ministers of the word, that they might learn what they ought to think, to say, to do, and to expect. And in all, these, all its parts, it is full of the most learned precepts and manifestly divine admonitions, exhortations, and promises. That is to say, he arms and equips his preachers how they are to be prepared, how they ought to think, and how they should be confident. As ministers of the word, we are sent out with a different mission than anything else that's out there. We, we are called to be proclaimers of the truth that is Jesus Christ, the salvation that he brings, the hope that we can find in him and him alone. Everything we do should be centered in Christ and Christ alone. We should look to his word and see the promises and the hope that is given to us by God and God alone. Looking at outside things, looking on the outward way, trying to take Things that are not of the Word of God and impose them upon the Word of God is not what we're called to do as preachers. We are not social justice warriors. We are, we are seeking out God's justice in the world. And that is different than social justice. Social justice often is based upon the tides and the trends of the world today, what we believe to be good and what we think or we want to think is something really good. And what happens is it causes us to lose sight of what it is that God is calling us to. We are called to be different than anybody else in the world. We call and we don't bend on the gospel. We don't bend on the word of God. We don't sit here and 
worry about areas in Scripture that people find problematic, but we look at the whole of Scripture, and then we help to have Scripture interpret Scripture. What was it? What was going on in this time? What was God doing? And ultimately, we look and we see how God is always working to renew, restore, and transform His creation. We see from the beginning, as sin entered into the creation, it wasn't that God couldn't stop it. And it wasn't that it was it was a part of oh, it was a part of the narrative. It was part of what God knew was going to happen, but He had a plan even from there to show how He was going to restore everything to right. Because God is a merciful and glorious God. Everything that God does is meant it has a greater meaning and depth. Why did He flood the entire entirety of creation? You know, could he have stopped sin? Most certainly. Could he have could he have made it where there was no suffering death? Yeah. Yeah. He wasn't powerless against the serpent. But there was something about how God created us in his own image. There's that we have been given an opportunity in which the Holy Spirit can move upon our hearts. And we have the opportunity to know and understand and believe in God. And we have the opportunity to to bend our knee. Uh, But we only can do so by the power of the Holy Spirit and the revelation of it. If we want to be bound by the sinful things of this world, if we want to love this world, then we're not we're going to find it very difficult to turn and believe into God believe in God we're going to follow it's going to be difficult to follow him but see ultimately you know had eve just trusted in the word of god but where was the failure they didn't know sin at that time they were innocent but then we also think about the fact that there wasn't the care that was given to the gospel. There wasn't the care that was given to the relationship with God. It was just there. They didn't have to work to be in relationship with God, Adam and Eve. They had everything before them. But the great sin was, is there's that part of our sin in ourselves that we find that when the words ring in our ears, to be like God, to be like God. And ultimately, that was the sin that they fell into. And that's the sin that we struggle against, to be like God. We want to be the ones that are in control. We want to be the ones that are the great I am. We want to be the ones that have the power instead of being the ones that bow our knee and bend our knee and ask for God's mercy, ask for God's care, ask for God's guidance, and to trust in the guidance that God gives us. Unfortunately, when we trust in ourselves over and above God, we often miss out on what it is that God is doing. Had the disciples, when they went out and were made the apostles, and they went out in the twelve, and they went into these communities, had they looked and they they decided to do different than what Jesus had commanded, what would be the blessing to them? None. Because they, they were being disobedient. They weren't following what God wanted them to do. And the thing is, is everybody would have looked at them very differently in the world. Oh, they're charlatans. All they want to do is do things to enrich themselves, uh, fill their bellies. And ultimately, when Jesus was sending them out, he was sending them out with these gifts, this power, this proclamation, not to enrich themselves, but to be a voice of salvation to those that needed to know it. Did everyone believe? No. By no means, otherwise there would have been no need for Jesus to go to the cross. But see, so many hearts were bound against God and God's will. They wanted to be made right. They wanted to be righteous. So they leaned so much upon the law that they found their own righteousness. They could be self-righteous. Because if I can keep the law, or at least keep it as I understand it, then I am good. I'm right. I'm perfect with God. And the reality is, is none of us can do or keep the law to be perfect in the eyes of God. It doesn't matter how we understand the law. It's always an understanding of how does God understand the law? What does God see? Is everything in our hearts perfect and pure? See, at the time of Luther, one of the great things that happened was uh, he was standing up against all of the various 
various breaches, the breaks, the things that uh, the church was doing that was contrary to what God desired. It was contrary to what God was doing, what God was meaning to do in the world. It was not what the way God desired it to be. You know, at the time of Luther, it was a thing of you had to do certain things for salvation. You had to do some work. You had to make sure that you you would uh, you you earned enough points. You needed to to be able to 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 earn your way into heaven to work off your sin or your shortcomings. So, you know, I might help my neighbor, but I'm only helping my neighbor because it's good for me to help my neighbor. So that way, I receive forgiveness. See, the difference that we believe now as Lutherans, sometimes we focus on as Lutheran Christians, we miss out on the opportunities of serving our neighbor because we think, well, I'm free in Christ. I can do whatever I want and he will forgive me. So that doesn't mean I have to do anything more. Or we go on the other side of saying, well, if I don't do these things, which is the same thing that Luther was fighting against, then I'm just not a bad, I'm a, I'm not doing the right things. I'm not living up to God. I'm not showing the fruits. It's not about showing the fruits. It's about living it and living it in a way that's not self-serving. If, uh, if it's all about making sure you're showing fruits, who are you serving? Yourself, right? You want to make sure that people see you as good. They, you want to make sure that people see you as holy. But the reality is, is God doesn't want that service from us. He wants us to serve him in the purity and the calling of what is it, it not because it benefits God, all the service in the world doesn't, co- it doesn't bring us any more salvation than, than what we've already received on the cross. But it does bring salvation to those that maybe don't know God. And the essence of that means that if we are reflecting Christ's love out into the world and a heart is turned and we tell them and we share with them what it is that we believe, that we trust, what we follow, we share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. We haven't done any work to save us anymore. The work's already been done by Christ on the cross. But that person that we share our faith with, now their life may be transformed. They may hear exactly what it is that God did and what God does. And that is a a great and glorious gift because we are able to reflect that light to another. And then somebody whose life might have been going down a path of darkness where they would have definitely entered the entered outside of Christ's love. They would not have known it. They may have died uh, without ever knowing the salvation that Christ had given them. And in the end, they just, so, so what they would do is if we didn't share with them everything that they needed to know, everything that they, about Jesus, we didn't share with them about faith, uh, and the Holy Spirit never moved upon them. Then all of a sudden, uh, wow, what would that? What would end up? How can we change and transform lives? Is it our changing? No, no, definitely not. It's not our changing anyone's life. We don't. Uh, it's the Holy Spirit's work that's being done in them, and the Holy Spirit is working through us. And do we trust that the Holy Spirit will work through us? And that's another. That's another difficult thing. A lot of people. Uh, may struggle with is the Holy Spirit truly working within me? How how can the Holy Spirit use me? Well, you look at the people that G, that Jesus called. They weren't anything extraordinary. They weren't people that were would have been looked at in society, going, "Wow, these are great men. Wow, I want to be just like them." No, these would have been the normal people. Many people, probably the Pharisees and many of the leadership in the church, may have looked at them, going, "Huh." Why, why would, what, what is this ragtag group here? I mean, you've got fishermen, you've got tax collector, you got all these people. And, and then he's got some other people, women and others that are with him too, that, man, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't think I want to be affiliated or associated with them. I mean, look at them. They're not, they're not the best of the cream of the crop. What? Couldn't he get anybody better? No, no. These were, I mean, but these were the people God chose. And he chose them because he chooses us. See, we're not any better just because we believe in Jesus. We're better 
or, you know, well, we are better because we believe in Jesus, but I mean, we're not better than anybody else in the eyes of the world, right? I mean, in the world, we, we are just like everybody else in some extent, because all of us, if we are truly honest, if uh, somebody were to root back into our past and this new mindset of virtue signaling here that we see out in the world today, all of us have those things in our past that we would look at and go, oh my goodness, I hope nobody ever learns about that. Man, I am so embarrassed about that. Man, that was a different time in my life. Oh, we shouldn't be looking at those afraid and going, oh my goodness gracious. But we look at those things and go, thank you, God, that you have changed my life. You have changed my heart. You have changed the direction I was going. I am not the same person I was before. And we celebrate that reality because that is that is where the rubber hits the road. When we believe and we trust what Jesus is doing and we trust in what he's called us to do. See, when they these these apostles entered to these villages, they came proclaiming a message and that, that would move the hearts of those who the Holy Spirit was moving upon and was placing in them a great hunger. That was the point. There were people out in these areas and these villages that were waiting. They, they were waiting. They knew something was coming. They were waiting for Messiah. They were waiting for it. And that's what we are called to do. In the beginning, God created man and woman. In his image, he created them. We read that in the first chapter of Genesis. And God created us in the Im- in his own image because we are that special. Not, there's not one of us in the world that is not special in that sense to God. All of us bear the image of God. Now, you know, we often separate ourselves be, by this false construction of race. And race, yes, it's... It's it's been around. It's changed uh, as an understanding of what it means to be a different race. What is race? Uh, you know, there was one time. You know, uh, I you know uh, my family we we were part of the Irish race and the English race and the Welsh race and the Scottish race and the German race and the Norwegian race or the Viking race. And now we have all the other breakdowns and variations that we find. The same thing is true when you look at race at the time of, uh, you know, stunning the various races that uh, came through Darwin and uh, and how that study became and how there were and and throughout history there have been groups of people that some were put lesser. I mean, at one point, you know, we know that Jews, the idea of the term ghetto is actually. That word is an Italian word, and it uh, was the place where the Jews were separated from all good people because you put your Jews in their own ghettos, their own communities, and they could come out and work in other areas, but they had to live in their own community. And then that's, but there's been that history and time where certain people groups have been segmented away and, and made lesser than others. Uh, and we see it in out, throughout history. Uh, the indigenous peoples were made lesser. People of African descent were made lesser, were treated less than. And then it was justified even further as Darwin wrote his manifest piece of his big piece that uh, the descent of man. And you look and we see and we look at all of the you know, there are the charts that came out in evolutionary mentality of, you know, there are certain groups of people that are closer to our evolutionary ancestor of an ape person or an ape-like being, uh, an ape-like hominid. And you had the various stages So the closer you were to that ape-like hominid, the less human you truly were. And the more animal was within you. You couldn't rationally think. 
We need to look back at many much of that, and as Christians, it's good to apologize. It's good to apologize and say, I'm sorry. It's sad that every Sunday morning, uh, even since Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech, and one of the comments that he made in his time was that the most segmented, segregated time is Sunday mornings at church. As Christians, it's good for us to apologize and realize the wrongs that we have helped to perpetrate by dividing more on things of less importance. Ultimately, our message is one that uh, is one of hope and promise as we seek Jesus in every aspect of our lives. And remember that lives matter. And life is important. Life is precious. Life is wonderful. And we look at the segments of our society that are being targeted by some. And we stand against it. We need to. That's because Jesus Jesus spoke against the segmentation at the time when he was in ministry, when he had the woman that came to him with the hemorrhaging. A woman that was segmented out of society. When the woman who was not a Jew came to the dinner and begged for the healing of her daughter. And when Jesus said, should I feed the bread meant for the Jews, the children of Israel? And the woman said, well, even the dogs wait for the scraps that fall under the master's table. Or the Samaritan woman at the well, traveling in a portion that no good rabbi would ever travel with his disciples, and revealing to her her own sin, because she was segmented out with even within her own group, of a group of people that were segmented out against Jew, by the Jews. Or the woman that wept and washed Jesus' feet with her tears and her kisses and dried it with her hair. If you knew who this woman was, Jesus, you wouldn't let her do that. Uh, one man is forgiven a great debt and one is forgiven a little. Which one would love the Lord the more? Of course, the one who is forgiven a great debt. There are so many areas in which Jesus gives us guidance on how we are to stand humbly when we see the wrongs that we that are in our world and our society as Jesus stood against it in his time and his age. We are called to also stand against it because we know the salvation that God has for us all. We know the promises. And we're meant to share it. We're not meant to hide. And we're not meant to sit and act all weak and not willing to stand up for the word of God. There are many, uh, there are many I know in this world that may disagree with me. And, and I know that. Um, there are some who have determined that they desire to have issue with me, and I am saddened by that. In my life, I try to reflect Christ's love in everything that I do, and, and I honestly 
hold no ill will. And I'm sure if all of us are honest, we could look in our lives and we know that there are always people who don't agree. Jesus faced that in his day too. He faced it in his life. He faced it to the cross. But he responded in love. He responded in kindness. He didn't say, oh, I'm sorry I did whatever I did that make you offended. He said, forgive them. When they smacked him across the face, he said, what have I done that deserves this treatment? What have I done? When confronted with the gospel, there are two options. Either you kneel and bow your knee and are accepting of it, you are humbled by it, or you bolster up in pride and go against it and do whatever it is that you feel makes you right. The wounds that we see in our world today are wounds of sin, great sin, and we have sinned against so many in this world. But we are also called and prepared. We don't go out with weapons of destruction. We do go out in spiritual warfare with our greatest weapon that we are given, and that is our prayer. But then also we can do in our service, even against those that dis disagree with us and those that dislike us. We can offer them a cup of water. We can offer them food. We can offer them prayer. We can offer them kindness. We can stand up if we see abuses against them. We can speak out and say, that is not right. Let's stop. We don't have to sit and watch and see the negative things and, oh, well, we have to and excuse that. Sin is sin. There's no reason for riots. There's no reason to destroy property. There's no reason to hurt other people. Violence only perpetuates more violence. We need to pray for our police officers also, as they are in such a difficult time, too. And they do call, and they do serve, and they do more good than harm. Now, some may find that as a controversial statement, but the reality is, is most of the police officers out there are great and good people. They're doing the work that, uh, it's a ministry that they do. And I know many officers of the law that are ministers also, that do hold ministry degrees. I've met them. Uh, and there, and and that is, but they also feel called to to protect and to serve, to keep the peace, as the old way would be, the peace officer mentality, that their whole purpose is not to bring harm or make things or escalate violence, but to be bearers of peace and to bring calm, to save those that are being harmed. We need to pray for the family of George Floyd as we. Still, we see what happened there, and we do pray for all families that have lost anyone to violence or anything of that nature. We need to also continue to pray for those that are being affected by the coronavirus, and we do pray for that, that end, too. Ultimately, we have great wounds in our nation that have been kind of ignored to some extent because we, 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 have, uh, we, we do just temporary covers instead of really dealing with the depth of what we need to do to be able to start to bring healing. We can't repair the damage. We can't go back and fix it, but we can pray for the healing of that wound, and we can look forward in ways in which we can do things differently and act differently and work differently. Not necessarily changing the definition of words but maybe changing the words that we say or how we say them and humbly, humbly listen to one who is expressing their sorrow, their frustration. Let the stories come out. Let them tell the stories. And there's, if you go to the uh, Association of Renewal Churches or you're going to find uh, on there, Renewal Congregations, uh, you're going to find on their Facebook page, 
you will find a great preacher who shares the stories of what he knew growing up as he was found his family moved him out of Texas they moved from Texas up to Minnesota uh, to escape some of the struggles that they faced in Texas and on the way up and some of the issues that were stories that were carried on by grandparents to their grandkids saying when I was young this is what happened it's good to hear those stories and understand the suffering that way they went through it's good also to pray and pray for God's change in our hearts our hearts and forgiveness where we maybe have fallen short or maybe have had those negative thoughts on our side but we ask we ask humbly that uh, we move forward praying for our nation we ask lord the lord move us and drive us ever closer to the reality of who it is that we believe in and we ask the Lord to continue to strengthen us in the faith that he gives us. I thank you for taking this time with me as I reflect with you some of the things that are on my heart. And I hope they have been moving for you too. If you'd like uh, to leave a comment or whatever, please do so in the comment section there of what you thought of this. And uh if there are things you'd like to talk about or thoughts you have, or maybe even some points of disagreement, just let me know. And uh, I can address that, and we can talk through that together. Uh, and, uh, you know, I can also address it in uh, future segments there. If there's portions of Scripture that you struggle through, uh, just let me know, and we can discuss those too. I can do another segment eventually here as I do get my bandwidth up more and am able to possibly broadcast this live. I will... Also do that where maybe in the future we'll have opportunities to be able to hold discussions live and I will be able to answer directly as I'm on and I will let people know ahead of time when I'm going to do that, of course. Uh, so that way you may join me. Uh, if you've really enjoyed this, please share it uh, and uh, invite others to jump on board and, and offer up their comments and things too. I thank you for giving me your time and I look forward to next week as I come I try and do this on Wednesdays uh, so that way you'll be able to enjoy it with me uh, enjoy it on Wednesdays but uh, every week I will do this and sometimes if I as time allots or uh, I may offer more opportunities if there are more people that like to do this is more of a time to be able to discuss things going on and events today as well as, well as with scripture uh, but I am your servant in Christ, and I thank you for this opportunity. Let me close in prayer. Gracious and Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for any opportunity that I can come together and I can speak about your glory, your word, your way, and uh, be able to prayerfully, hopefully, draw others ever closer to you. I ask you, Lord, to continue to pour your spirit upon my community, my household, the congregation I serve, and all congregations in Christ, that they come and they humble themselves to you, that more and more people come to know and believe in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, because it is all to your glory that all this glorious work is being done. Continue to abide, through, abide in us through this week and bring us safely into another week. In your holy name, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.